Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, I started this YouTube channel for a couple of reasons. The first one, of course, was to try and put out some education and correct some things that I saw on YouTube that were in error um, with the correct information. I wanted to do home science teaching and do critical thinking and basically learn a new hobby. Now the other and perhaps the more selfish reason was I wanted an excuse to learn something. And while a lot of the videos that I've put out so far have been educational in nature, this one's educating me because this is a subject that I don't know very much about and that is the Big Bang. Now, like many people, I was a little bit confused initially with the thought of the Big Bang. I had this vision in my head of a singularity that exploded and then everything blew out from it. That's not really the case. So after reviewing a lot of material and talking to some very smart people, I came up with this video and I hope that perhaps at least this will give us a start on an understanding of what the Big Bang Theory is. So cue up the music and let's go. You know, when I was in medical school, one of my instructors came up and told the class that in 15 years, if you pick up a journal in your field and recognize what they're talking about in at least half the table of contents, you're probably doing a pretty good job keeping current with medicine. I came to the understanding that you don't need to know every single detail in order to have a basic understanding of a field. My intellect is not sufficient to be able to understand all of Einstein's equations. I don't understand quantum mechanics. I'm not a physicist. That is some pretty high-ended stuff. I wanted to kind of get a basic feel for what the Big Bang was. And let me tell you how I did it. I'm kind of a visual learner, so I got my father's old slide rule out. And I got to thinking that if this is me, and this is another galaxy, and they were that far apart, all right, I can comprehend that to some extent. Now, with the Big Bang Theory, at first I thought that what happened was everything started off here together, and then blew up and started expanding out. I'm wrong. What happened was this piece of tape and that piece of tape are on the same part of the slide rule. The only difference between the two, they're not moving, but the space in between them is getting bigger. And there was a time, if this is now, there was a time that we were only half as far apart because space had only expanded half as much. And then as you went back in time, we got closer and closer together until we got down to about 400,000 years after the Big Bang event. And you see this little gap right here between the beginning and 400,000 years? We can learn a lot about that gap all the way down to about 1 to 10 to the negative 32 seconds after these two items separated. But that little gap right there, that's where they keep the Nobel Prizes for physics. Well, the first 400,000 years of the universe is where the fun begins. So let's kind of take that back a little bit. Let's go back to about 1 times 10 to the negative 32 seconds after the Big Bang occurred. The universe was a tiny little thing, not quite a singularity, but not much larger. And it was an amorphous blob of high energy particles and fragments of atomic nuclei. Now the temperature of this blob was so high and there were so many fo high energy photons imparting energy on all particles in this that any time one of these fragments of an atomic nuclei tried to stick together to something else, a photon would just knock them apart again. Until about one millionth of a second, when the universe had expanded and cooled sufficiently that these fragments of atomic nuclei could actually start sticking together a little bit. As these fragments started coalescing and, and sticking together a little bit, 
as time went on, they developed electron clouds around them. So you start off with something that is a neutron or a proton, and then you get an electron cloud around it. That's called ionization. And ionization occurred sometime between that one millionth of a second and about 400,000 years. The atomic mass of hydrogen is one, the atomic mass of helium is two. So first you had the hydrogen, then you had the helium. Now this process was outlined in something called the Alpha Beta Gamma paper, which was published in 1948. Now, Ralph Alpher was a graduate student who was writing a PhD dissertation in physics, and his advisor was, was Dr. Gamow. Now, Gamow had a sense of humor because he thought he was onto something here and he wanted to, I guess, make it kind of a cute title. So he got a hold of his friend, uh, another physicist by the name of Bethay, over at Cornell University. And that gave them the Alpha, Beta, Gamma paper. Now, a few years later, they tried to use the equations predicted by this paper to estimate the proportion of hydrogen and helium in the early universe. They used the computers at the National Bureau of Standards and a gentleman by the name of R.C. Herman. Now, they tried to get him to change his name to Delta so that they could have the Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta paper, but he wouldn't do it. Now, how do we know this happened? The first thing that we can do is take Einstein's theory of general relativity and basically run time backwards towards zero. And that works fine. Uh, we're very comfortable back to 400,000 years after the event. And remember, that event was 13.8 billion years ago. Now, as we go from 400,000 years down to about 1 times 10 to the negative 32 seconds after the event, things start getting squirrely. Quantum mechanics starts becoming more prominent. And then as you get very close to t minus zero, you start running into problems because, for example, we have four primary forces in nature. These four primary forces of nature being, of course, gravity, electromagnetism, strong and weak nuclear forces. As we get closer to the Big Bang, what happens is these forces start to merge together. And the problem is, is when you get down to that tiny fraction of a second afterwards where these forces are starting to merge together, we really don't know what they're doing. We don't know how they'll act on things and what they're acting on. And as I said, that's where they keep the Nobel Prizes for physics. Go in there and unlock that mystery and you can pick yours up. Period of time from about 1900 to about 1920 was pivotal in our understanding of the Big Bang Theory. During that time, initial spectroscopies of faraway galaxies were taken. They uh, examined the light from these galaxies and found that they were all what we call red shifted. So the spectra was shifted towards the red end of the spectrum, which indicated that they were moving away from us. And we found that in every galaxy that we looked at in every quadrant of the sky. Everything was moving away from us. Everything was expanding. Now, in general, all galaxies are moving away from every other point in the universe. And that's why they're redshifted. There are a couple of exceptions. For example, Andromeda is a nearby galaxy to the Milky Way. The gravitational attraction between Andromeda and the Milky Way is sufficient that it can counteract that expansion and these galaxies are slowly moving together and eventually they will merge. Okay, so the first bit of evidence is the fact that with almost without exception, galaxies in the universe are all moving apart. The only exception being ones that are very close together and their gravitational force is overcoming this expansion, such as the Milky Way and Andromeda. Now, piece of evidence number two is galaxy GNZ11. Galaxy GNZ11 is the farthest galaxy that we have ever observed. And given its redshift, we know that it is moving away from us at a certain velocity. As you recall, in the first 400,000 years of the Big Bang, elements began to form, with the first element being hydrogen. When you look at light from a distant galaxy, you will see absorption bands 
in that light from the elements that the uh, light is passing through. The interesting thing about galaxy GNZ11 is it only shows one absorption band, and that is for hydrogen. There's no absorption for helium. So the light that we're seeing was created after the formation of hydrogen, but before the formation of helium. The timeline on that is 376,000 years after the Big Bang. Due to the red shift that was occurring and the fact that it's taken 13.4 billion years for that light to reach us, we now know that that galaxy is some 32 billion light years away from us. This, of course, brings up a very interesting question. If the universe is only 13.8 billion years old, how can something be 32 billion light years away? Well, let's have a look at the moon. Now, the moon is approximately 240,000 miles away. The light that we see from the moon left the moon's surface about 1.2 seconds ago. So what we're actually looking at is where the moon was 1.2 seconds ago. It's shifted a little bit since then, imperceptibly, but a little bit. Now, what if the moon was moving away from us in, in an accelerated fashion? Okay, if the moon was moving away from us at light speed, we would see it exactly where it was 1.2 seconds ago. Now, as it moved away, we would see it where it was however long it took the light to get to us. But it would actually be further away because it's coming up on the speed of light. Once it reaches the speed of light on the acceleration, the light will not have enough time to get back to us before the moon is too far out of range, so to say. So literally, the moon will blank out. The same thing is happening with this galaxy. We're looking at it 13.4 billion years ago. It's accelerating away from us by its redshift at an extremely rapid rate. We can tell where it is based on the time that it took that light to get to us we're seeing where it was 13.4 billion years ago. It's currently 32 billion light years away from us because we can check the acceleration. That's what the redshift does. Now the final thing is, what about this talk of the speed of light being a speed limit, an absolute hard speed limit in space? Well, it is, but that's for things traveling through space. It doesn't have to do with the expansion of space space can expand faster than the speed of light. And that's what's happened. Now, when the Big Bang occurred, heat was released. That heat was in the infrared band. As it expands away from us, it red shifts down to the microwave band. And what we're looking at here is a map of the universe, and this is called the background microwave radiation. It is present everywhere. This is the echo of the Big Bang. So I hope that you found this helpful. And I'm going to go ahead and stop it there because I think that that's enough for right now. The interesting thing that I, I like about this is that I don't understand this fully myself. And I have people that don't understand why rocks fall to the ground try and argue with me about it. So that's always kind of a source of amusement for me but at least you have some sort of basic idea of what the table of contents looks like now. So this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by. I really appreciate you visiting my channel, maybe even joining Team Bob. Before you leave, make sure you hit that little like and subscribe button down there and hit the bell icon so that you know when new videos come out. Take care, guys.